Hello, and welcome to Doing Diversity in Writing, the podcast where we, as writers, explore the do's and don'ts of writing inclusively, whether that be in terms of race, gender, ethnicity, class, sexuality, ability, and so on. Why are we here? To bring more depth and breadth to the characters in our fiction and represent them in the best way possible. My name is Bethany Ann Tucker, and with me is my co-host, Marielle S. Smith. Let's get started. Hi, so how are you this week, Marielle? Hey, Bethany. I'm good. I'm, um, I think I told you about this. I've recently, I don't know about you, actually, but sometimes I get these story ideas that just won't leave me alone. And I never allow myself to be distracted by them. So I never pause the work, the thing that I'm working on to uh, just lose myself into this other thing. Um, and I have a lot of clients who do exactly that. So I'm like, no, don't do that. But I do make notes. Um, and sometimes then the story leaves me and sometimes it's very persistent. So this current story is very persistent. So I started doing some research in the shape of reading books in the genre. I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with the genre. It's cozy mystery. Um, so I've started doing that. Um, it's very rainy. I'm in the Netherlands right now. It's very rainy. So I hit up the local library checked out their English section and just got some detectives and and cozy mystery novels. And the first one I read is set in South Africa. Um, And there's just so much diversity in it. And the backdrop is uh, the death of Nelson Mandela. And it's just, the the author is a white woman and it's just so nicely done. I think um, that racism is a topic but it's not at the forefront. So you feel that she did her research or she lived the kind of life where she had the ability to write about it well? Well, she lives exactly, uh, she lives in the Mm -hmm. Karu and it's this novel set there. So she lives there as well. Um, But if you read her acknowledgements, she has done her research. Like so many people have read it. Um, There's like pages and pages of names and names of people who've read it, helped with the different languages. Like there's a little bit of Afrikaans in there, which is fun for me because I I understand these words. Um, um, Because that has a history of Dutch involved in it, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Afrikaners, they, uh, they, um, it was the Dutch who arrived. uh, um, it's It's a very... We, we still celebrate it to a certain extent, not me personally, but um, we still have names uh, in the Netherlands, like street names of uh, Jan van Riebeek, and he's the one who set foot um, and, and created the first colony. Um, I'm so, very yeah. tempted to get you started on a history lesson, but I promise. Yeah, yeah, let's not do that. That I would so, be because- focused today. <laughs> Yeah, you always rein me in because I, you know, when I go off, it it, it ends, and I do know a lot about South African history, so you don't want it, uh, you don't want that. But it was a nice surprise because I picked the book just because I just saw the cover and I was like, "This is like this is a cozy See, mystery." Covers are important, people. Yes, very important. And then I picked up, so I picked up four books. I'm reading the second one now, and this one in this one, the main character um, is a lesbian. But that's not, that was a complete surprise because that's nowhere. You found it right. in the wild. I found it in the wild. It's a it's a novel set in the 30s, 1930s, just after, well, not just after, well, just before the Second World War, basically. Um, but they talk about the war. Uh, so that was, of course, for, for it's set in the UK, so the Great War for, for, for uh, British people. Uh, and that was just, for me, it was like such a nice because it's not advertised as LGBTQI+, plus, et cetera. Yeah. It's just, it's, it sounds like, it is. Oh, that is really nice. That's just diversity done in a very, yeah, just, just not diversity because of diversity's sake. You're going to have to include the names of those two books in our show notes. I will. Yes. All right. So I'm going to move us on to our topic today. Sorry, unless unless you have something to share. Oh, me? Um, 
I'm winning my war with cockroaches. We should probably leave it at that. <laughs> I have a new house. We'll talk about it more in another episode. <laughs> okay, so I'm doing my re- research. Uh, you're probably researching ecological cockroach. Let's just say that my Aikido training and pieces of a desk that I will use in my office, am using in my office, um, came together for the destruction of a three inch long cockroach that was in my office very effectively. Yeah, let's let's leave it. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Topic of today. Topic of today. Come oh, on. Something that's actually scarier than cockroaches. The topic of today. Well, we are talking about fears today. Yes. Yes. And many people are afraid of bugs. So I'm saying this is actually scarier for some people than bugs. Um, it is. Yeah. Okay. So, so we have some fears here. And I think I've been nominated to start with the first one. So I'm just going to jump into it because that's what you do when you're facing something you're scared of, right? You just jump. Okay. That's not what everyone does, but it's usually what I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So fear number one is what if I represent someone the wrong way? And I'm going to say that I'm, this fear isn't number one on our list because we're saying this is the number one fear everyone has. We're saying that this is where we're starting. I know the another, another fear for a lot of people is what if there's a blowback or what if I get called out and we're going to get there. We're just not there yet. So this, this very common fear of, uh, what if I represent someone the wrong way? Um, like, what if I misrepresent characters that aren't like me? Like, saying this as a writer. Um, this is the fear of doing it wrong. It's probably, you know, it's, it, it's probably one of the top two or three fears everyone talks about. During episode one, we've already established that it's, it's more than okay. You really can write characters who are nothing like you. And if you haven't heard episode one, go back and listen to it now and then come back and finish this episode. Um, And if you don't agree with us, especially after listening to episode one, that's fine. We're sure there's plenty of people who won't agree with us, but that is how we see it. You can write characters who are not like you. um, And that's where the line is for us. (laughs) Yes. And uh, like, this is something that some people might agree to disagree on with us. Um, but yeah, we we both absolutely agree that you can, you probably are all writing, writing characters or nothing like you. So it's absolutely fine um, as long as you do it in an informed, uh, sensitive and sensible manner. And I think that's a phrase we're going to repeat like tons of time. Um, that said, and I think this is where this fear, this very common fear of like, what, what do I do? what if I represent somebody in the wrong way, right? And there is like a backlash. I would say that not all differences are considered equal, Um, like depending on where we are as a society uh, and which society that you're writing about, some identity markers might carry more charge than others do. And this is why some misrepresentations cause more outrage than others. And this might, you know, yeah, as a result of that, you know, we might be more scared of representing this character uh, the wrong way then we're scared of representing that character the wrong way yeah um i think we need to make this really concrete for people do you do you have any examples to make this more tangible yes um always um okay so let's say you write a character who wears glasses right um and when you're writing you forget like consistently uh, you forget to mention uh, or describe their glasses fogging up when they enter a building, you know, after after they've been in the rain, you know, or um, the glasses fogging up when they open the oven or, you know, they lift the lid of a pot to see, you know, whether the food is ready. Um, even when they leave their mug to sip their coffee or tea, right? Um, because that's something that does happen. And something I know that, that because... Yeah, a lot during COVID, people with glasses were complaining about masks. And I was like, what are you talking about? For example, yeah, so for me, so I wear, uh, despite my young age, I wear reading glasses. And that's just because I'm behind computers so often uh, that I get a little, I get headaches um, if I don't wear glasses when I work. So I have it occasionally, like when I drink my tea. But for example, if you wear glasses all the time, 
yeah, during COVID, it was a thing. And people, I've seen so many hacks on, on the internet for people who wear glasses um, because it was a thing. And I do have to admit, like living in Cyprus where the sun shines a lot, wearing a mask in Cyprus, we still have to wear uh, masks outside despite the heat. And if you wear sunglasses and your masks, your mask at the same time, that is, yeah, that is very annoying. Um, so yeah, if you don't wear glasses, you don't know what it's like. Like you said, right? Like what are the what are these people talking about? So when when you write a person with glasses, you don't mention any of these things. Somebody who does wear glasses, you know, they might you know roll their eyes and go like, yeah, okay, this writer clearly has no clue what it's like to wear to wear glasses, right? So, you know, worst case scenario, your reader might be a bit frustrated, you know. Of course, it depends on how they've experienced being a person with glass uh, with glasses, you know. But usually it's not that highly charged because generally speaking, at least in our part of the world, wearing glasses doesn't make you disenfranchised, right? You don't get killed by the police just for wearing glasses. And it doesn't stop you from having access to decent housing or jobs. You aren't treated as some unwelcome alien because of your glasses. You aren't banned from getting married or marrying a person who's not wearing glasses. Um, you get my point, right? So yeah. if you misrepresent someone with glasses in, 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 a, in, a particular, in, in that kind of way, that doesn't necessarily harm the glass wearing community. Yeah, right? for, for our section of the world. There, there have been oh. times in history like yes. communist in Asia where those regimes were taking place where it was. But for here yes. in English, not so much. And here, I mean, Engl uh, the U.S. and Europe. Yes. So that's my one side of the example, right? But if you misrepresent somebody who is Black, Indigenous, of color, who's queer, or somebody who has a disability that creates more of a challenge than, you know, having to wear glasses is, you won't be as easily forgiven as a writer by members of those communities when you get something wrong. Um, and especially not when you get it very, very wrong. Because these people are already disenfranchised. And because of that, it hurts that much more if they are being seriously misrepresented. And I would say, depending on how sticky your misrepresentation is, it could actually cause actual damage to living human uh, breathing human beings yeah and that that we can't take that lightly at all um no. i'm just gonna stick it in here we both highly recommend the article saying yes you should be afraid to write diverse characters by mo black that's mo is his first name and then black is the last name um, they're very honest and in your face about why we shouldn't take this lightly and really what you need to consider before taking the step of writing a diverse character that is more, more of a highly charged, there's a higher risk in writing this kind of diverse character because there's a range of diverse characters and the risk involved. Yes, um, and we will put those, that link in the show notes as well. It's, it's a really good article. Um, and what I would like to add here actually is that, especially if the diverse characters that you're writing are main characters in your story, uh, or even secondary ones instead of really minor ones, right? I don't think we've brought this up before, but there is a difference. There's a difference between, you know, slipping in a few diverse characters at the periphery of your plot. You know, that's one thing, but, and, and it's also something that many of us are much more comfortable with. But it's not a gesture that doesn't, it's not necessarily a gesture that challenges the status quo, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because the more minor your characters are, your diverse characters are, the less fleshed out they will be. And it, it also means that the story is less about them and less about their voices. So for me, this very much speaks to the quantity versus quality discussion that we had in our previous episode, episode number two. Like quantity wise, adding diverse minor characters does lead to more representation yeah. but quality wise while it might go some way to normalize their presence that's all it does and that isn't a bad thing but i, I do think we can do so much better yeah it, it's good that it's there but if yeah. we can go far further let's go farther and some some writers are definitely not there yet like adding the the minor characters in for diversity is where they're at and i respect that if we can go farther so much better yes. um 
And there are plenty of authors who've written main and secondary characters unlike them who have done a, a really good job. I'm thinking Anne Rice, for example, she's renowned for her portrayal of Lestat, a male vampire. Um, this is a very masculine character surrounded primarily by masculine companions. Um, and Anne is decidedly a woman, but she draws this male character, in my opinion, exquisitely. Um, also, Terry Pratchett, um, he writes amazing women characters. I, I'm in awe of them, like the way he fleshes them out and gives them details, and they have this huge range of emotions on them in his Discworld series. Um, those are very believable and, I believe, good uh, characterizations that he's done as a man of female characters. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking of J.K. Rowling uh, telling the story of Harry, who's a male youth. Um, yeah. And I, I, there's a lot wrong with other aspects of our work, including the Harry Potter books. Um, let's not forget about that. But she did write a best-selling series about a boy growing into an adult as an adult woman. Yeah. And it was, it was believable. Yeah. Um, there's also Scott O'Dell. He's a man, wrote women characters. I mean, all the books I've read by him had women ma uh, main protagonists, um, teenage women especially. And he did well, in my opinion. Um, I know at least some other people agree with me. Island of Blue Dolphins is what I'm thinking about, as well as the sequel, Zaya. Hmm. I, I, I don't know this. Oh, sorry. These were indigenous women off the coast of California in the U.S., so I can't speak to the representation of the indigenous community, um, but as a woman, a young woman reading them, um, they felt really good to me. Okay, well, I, I don't know this author, but I'm thinking um, Roy O'Dell wrote A Great Mathilda. Yep. And I have no idea, you know, uh, whether he <laughs> wrote all the women well. Like, I, I, I have read some of his work, but it's been a long, long time. Um, so aside from how he treated certain middle-aged women in that particular book, um, I have no idea uh, how he writes all the women generally. But I'm, I'm also thinking completely different genre. I'm also thinking MM romance. Yeah, that, that's a good example. There's some interesting examples in that genre. Well, if you're not familiar with the term, um, MM romance are books mostly written by women for other women in which the main pairing are uh, two men. So actually, come to think of it, I once heard that on an episode of the Creative Pen podcast that there are also straight men, I didn't know that before, that there are also straight men who write rather successful lesbian fiction. I heard and, this podcast, yeah. Yeah. Mm, it's a good episode. Uh, so no names were mentioned there, but I, I, I do remember uh, Claire Lydon, uh, who she was interviewing, saying that some of it has been good. And it doesn't mean everyone appreciates, you know, men writing lesbians, but some people do. Yeah. And some lesbians, if it's selling and that the community is buying, that's the important part. Yeah, and it was Claire Lydon who brought it up, like, she was the one saying, yeah, like some of it is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So, and she is known for her lesbian fiction. Nice. Uh, I need to read yeah. some of it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so for me, that's the same. Actually, uh, uh, MM Fiction is, a, is, is, is there's quite a story about that. Um, so apparently not all gay male writers appreciate women writing gay interaction. Um, I was on a podcast years ago and one of the hosts explained to me um, that that's why a lot of gay male writers simply differentiate between MM fiction and gay fiction. So the former being by and for women and the latter being by and for gay men. So I really don't know if that distinction still holds. It, it was years since I was on that podcast. Um, but what he, the ho one of the hosts was trying to say that to him, it was all good, right? Since both have their own audience, as long as that distinction is being made and they're not put under the same umbrella because they are not the same books and they don't have the same audience. Yeah. I could talk about that, just that genre and it's very subgenres for a long time, but I say for now just that it's an example of yeah. being successful and it, it, people who are not the people in their books being successful and not necessarily causing damage. There are some MM books that I'm like, okay, I can see that 
any gay man would be like, please burn that. But <laughs> um, they might be doing that. I would say that for myself, when I was exploring my sexuality as a young person, um, it was MM fan fiction um, that actually like helped me come to terms and get rid of some of the like the historically bigoted ideas that I grew up with in ultra conservative religion. So yeah, that that helped me get out of it, those stories. Whether or not they were well written or well represented in all ways, it was an avenue. And that probably happens for other people as well. And I went entirely like off track here. So <laughs> sorry. Um, so basically it, it boils down to the question of who gets to write what or what gave this or that Arthur the right to write this or that character? What mm -hmm. gave John Steinbeck the right to write stories about the down, downtrodden like he did in Mice and Men or The Grapes of Wrath? Or what gave J.K. Rowling the right to write from a perspective of 11-year-old boy? And the truth is no one gave them that right. They just they just did it. <laughs> That's yes. really what happened. Yes, and, and we don't see any reason why other writers cannot take that same right. Yeah. No, as long as they remember that with rights come responsibilities. And in this case, the responsibility is to do your absolute best to write your diverse character in the best way possible. And remember, diverse character for you as a writer could be many things depending who you are as a person. So keep that in mind. We're not talking diverse here just from the perspective of Europe or Asia or an able bodied person or, or whatever, because writers come in many stripes of their own. Yes, and this is, you know, we come back to the whole, as long as you do it in an informed, sensitive and sensible manner. We're going to keep saying that. Yes, <laughs> but I, I do want to say that if you find yourself thinking that very question, right, what gives me the right to write this or that character, right? I would say that if you're thinking that, you're already halfway there, because it means that you're at least somewhat aware that things are at stake and that you have to tread carefully, right? Um, because if you don't know, if you're not aware, you just write whatever you want to write and you're not even considering whether it's harmful or not, right? So mm -hmm. just, you're, just you asking yourself, should I be writing this? That means that you understand that there are certain dynamics at stake here and you have to be careful around those um, or be informed and sensitive and sensible around those. So what we would love to see happen all around us, of course, is that people, you know, instead of stepping away from the challenge because something is at stake, that they lean into that challenge and start taking those steps, you know, figure out for yourself why and what kind of characters you want to include in your work and then do the research necessary. Yeah. And careful doesn't mean that you're not doing something. You, you careful still means that you're moving forward, that you're still trying. It's not frozen. Um, what we're saying here, it makes me think of the other article we read recently on writing diverse characters. Um, it was by Randy Ingermanson. I think I'm saying his last name right. I don't know, but I do, rem I do remember the article, yeah. And on his website, it was called advancedfictionwriting.com. He summed it up really quite simply. The more unlike yourself your characters are, the more research you need to do. Uh, which is really an obvious answer right um so i remember that randy ingermanson he's not quite as critical as and thorough as mo black was uh in his answering of that that question um but he does end his post on a note that i really quite liked um so what he said let me look it up um Okay, so this is a quote from the article that we found on advanced writing. And what is it? Advancedfictionwriting.com. We'll include the, the link to the article in the show notes, of course. So he, Randy Ingerson says, um, there's no way to be a great writer unless you're first ready to be a horrible, wretched, slocky, cliche-ridden, miserably bad writer. You get good by starting out bad. Some people can't handle that. Some people can. There's a word for people who can. Authors. Yes, that's so on point. I've been all of that. Sometimes I still am. <laughs> yes, I was I just going to say, I still am. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's what editing is for. Yes. And there's, there, there are loads of things that are hard to get right as an author, like so many. I, both mm -hmm. of us have decades of experience and you still feel like every time you sit it down on the keyboard, you're so humbled. Um, yes. right, right? You just yes. sit down, you're like, oh, I, I wrote that book. I don't know how I wrote that book. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to exactly. write another one. 
Um, How? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. (laughs) Yes. But the feeling of a place that you're trying to communicate through your words of an era, getting dialogue right, how characters interact, characters and story arcs that come full circle. Um, As a developmental editor, I can tell you all the ways that people don't get that right. Writing diverse characters is just one of the aspects that you are managing as you're writing a book or a short story, et cetera. You don't stop describing a place or cut all of your dialogue just because it's hard. Then you you wouldn't have a book. It just means that yeah. more research is needed. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say you can cut out all dialogue, but yeah. Uh, I don't yeah, particularly no. like those books. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, but what I was going to say is, um, you know, there's one thing we shouldn't forget is that even when we're writing characters who are more or less like us, not every reader is going to appreciate that particular portrayal. So you could be writing your own life story and have people go, ah, what? Someone like that would never do that. And, you know, that's simply because while these characters might look like you on the surface and while these readers might also look like you on the surface, they might actually be nothing like you and your characters. You know, they might not think like you. They might not want the same things as you. They might not have the same ideals as you because they aren't you, right? Mm -hmm. They'll have different lived experiences, all of them. So one reader might love how you portray a particular character, whether or not this character looks like you or not, while someone else from within that same community can't stand it. Exactly. That doesn't mean everything goes. Like, no, what you just said isn't like a a pass, but it doesn't mean that no matter how well informed you are, how many hours of research you put into something, how many people from this or that community you talk to and have put their stamp of approval on your book, there might still be some people who feel misrepresented by your work or find your characters unbelievable. And that's just because of the diversity within any community, like any community. In essence, no one is the same. Communities are made up of individuals, and even if someone does have these shared lived experiences, there's still no guarantee that they're all going to love or hate something. Like, I have seven brothers and sisters. We are very different people raised in the same house from the two same parents. Um, Some might love what you write, some might not, some might be absolutely neutral about it. Yeah. So... You know, while this is an excuse, like you said, it's not it's not a pass, right? It's not an excuse to represent someone in a careless, harmful way. Uh, it never is. But it does bear repeating that there's simply no way everyone is going to love your work or the characters within it. That is a simple fact, and it shouldn't keep us from trying the very best we can do. And neither should it keep us from trying to write stories about people beyond our comfort zone. Yeah, I have a I have a good example of this, actually, of doing everything you can to get it right and still being called out. Oh, oh, being called out is the worst. Do share. Okay, so this is a little bit of an older story. Um, William Styron, the author of Confessions of Nat Turner, a book written in first person about a black man who staged a revolt in the south of the USA. Um, This author who wrote the Confessions of Nat Turner was a very, very good friend with James Baldwin who was in a highly acclaimed mm-hmm. African-American author at the same time period. So Styron, who was white, actually had Baldwin stay with him in his house so that he could finish his own book, Baldwin's book, while Styron, Styron was working on confections, con- the confessions of Matt, Nat Turner. And Styron struggled because he was a white man. So he struggled as a white man writing from a black man's perspective. He was like, am I doing it right? Should I be doing it? But his friend... Baldwin um, encouraged him to stay the course and to finish writing the Confessions of Nat Turner. He even wrote the foreword for Styron's book when it came out. So Styron, as a white man, he did his research. He immersed himself in what little records there were of Nat Turner and the time period and everything. He did his best. Um, He did not just write out of his head. He did not write in isolation, but Styron still faced backlash, even with James Baldwin's support because he wrote in the voice from the head of a black man. Ouch. Yeah. But that's exactly it, right? Even when you do everything right, like I'm putting that in quotation marks, um, you're still opening yourself up to critique, but that's what everything you write. Um, And I think that's because people, and uh, so 
I, I just said like, and this is with everything you write, but it's especially the case when you write their first characters because people have rather strong feelings about this, you know, depending on the identity marker in question and the charge that it carries. Likewise, some people have strong feelings about who is telling their story, which gets us right back to our first episode where we explained we don't necessarily agree with the idea that only writers with certain identity markers should be writing characters with those exact same set of identity markers. Yeah, right. If it weren't for white writers writing diverse characters in the past, I wouldn't have really met anyone in my younger years who wasn't white and Protestant, to be honest. A um, little bit of Catholic on one side of my family. A lot of Catholic, to be honest. But anyway, <laughs> and it, it, is this a, a difficult murky field to be working in, writing diverse characters, characters not exactly like you? Yes, it is. Absolutely. However, I do sincerely, I I sincerely do not believe that hiding away from that tangle with the murkiness is the answer. Like, I I appreciate those those authors who I probably would not have been able to read. I wouldn't have met those diverse characters if a white writer hadn't written about it in the time period. Like, my parents Mm -hmm. wouldn't have bought the books necessarily. They wouldn't have been in the catalog that they bought books from, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this brings us to our second fear, right? What if, uh, so not second fear, like you said, it's not like one is the biggest. It's just of the three common fears we wanted to discuss today, this is the second one we're discussing. So what if by writing diverse characters, you are speaking out of turn, taking someone else's voice away, tell a story that isn't yours to share? Yes, this this gets really murky indeed. <laughs> yes, right. I actually had to do some tangling with this a few years back um, when I was going through the submissions to an anthology by and about bisexuals with my co-editor. Um, you know, even though we'd been crystal clear about this in our call for submissions, uh, we did get a few short stories written by people who call themselves allies um, and who like submitted a story. Um, because they wanted to contribute to the cause. Because the stories had to be by bisexuals, correct? Like written by a bisexual person. Yes, and that's something we make clear. Like the title is like stories by and by and about, right? So anyone who didn't feel exactly straight or gay, that was like that's that's where we were. Um, and because we've been so clear, we didn't have an answer ready to these ally contributors um ali ah i'm lost now i really had allies yeah and we really had to sit with that for a bit right together because you know maybe we should include these stories you know if we didn't see any harm in the portrayal of those bisexual characters maybe we should be doing that because isn't that where we want to end up everyone writing about anyone in a perfectly acceptable way so that there's no longer any lack of representations is that not one what we want to achieve in the end? Like this normalization of right, like normalizing writing people who aren't us. Yeah, I, I mean, I do actually absolutely want to normalize it. That's why we're recording this podcast. <laughs> yes. So that is the same discussion that we had. That that is exactly what we want to end up. But we still decided to tell these writers no that this anthology was truly going to be a platform for those who identify as bisexuals themselves or uh, fluid or, you know. Pan, omni. Pan, yes, all of those, yeah. Um, So what I want to clarify here is that we didn't uh, make that decision because we didn't believe these stories, you know. We didn't believe that stories by allies or whatever you want to call them aren't important, right? I think we need these writers and we need their stories simply because there's so much damage that needs to be undone. But this anthology, the specific anthology was about holding space for certain voices. And we figured you cannot truly hold space for someone if you don't hand over the mic entirely. So yes, we loved hearing from people who were already including bisexual characters in their work without being bisexual themselves, but it didn't fit the aim for this particular project. And this is why we said no. Because it was an own voices project. It was an own voices project. Um, but like I said, that doesn't mean I don't believe in both. We definitely need both. Yeah, that is, that's the thing. Like, you're, you're not choosing one or the other. 
Um, like you said, there's too much to be done to put the actual emotional and the, the actual labor on the people who belong to each of these, you know, communities, minorities. It's very much akin to what we hear now from a lot of Black people are speaking out against white supremacy. Mm-hmm. They are sick and tired of white people endlessly asking them to explain certain concepts and situations because that means even more emotional labor for them. And they've, they've already had it up to here. They had to live it the first time and every other time they've talked about it. Um, likewise, there's so many white people who seem to think that the Black Lives Matter isn't their place. Like they don't belong there. They can't be involved because it's clearly a Black people's issue, right? But if it weren't for white people, Black Lives Matters wouldn't need to exist. <laughs> That's right, right. And this is the thing, like supporting Black people in their struggle is already getting it wrong. It's not just their struggle, right? We're the ones who've created it. So if we really want to dismantle that system, we need to be at the forefront of that struggle and actively work towards dismantling something that has mostly benefited us. And I say mostly here because I dearly believe that white people suffer from white supremacy as well, right? Not in the same way. Absolutely not in the same way, but it has taken away so much of our our humanity and it's directly linked to things like toxic masculinity, how we destroying our planet, violence against women and animals, neoliberalism, capitalism. I mean, I could go on here, but. Yeah. And the, the same discussion, it relates to writing diverse characters all over the place. Do we need more diverse authors and their books available in our bookstores and libraries? Yes. Absolutely. Should we wait on them to fix everything that's going wrong with the current representation that we have about the characters they represent? Maybe not. (laughs) I mean, maybe we should be at the forefront of that struggle too with them, you know, not just supporting them, but making this our fight too. If this is our community, this is our wider community, then we're here too. Yeah, it is our fight too, right? Um, And the thing is like waiting on them to fix it is once again, putting that actual and emotional labor, not to say that emotional labor isn't actual labor, but I hope you get what I mean. It's once again, putting that labor on those who are already disenfranchised one way or another, right? And besides, as we keep saying, we are already writing diverse characters, at least to a certain extent. Nobody is writing characters who are just the way they are, right? Nobody is doing that. Um, So can you imagine male writers suddenly going, you know what, I'm not going to include any more female characters in my work from now on, because it's really up to women to do that work. Can you imagine the kind of books we'll be reading when that happens? Sounds like a sci-fi like example. (laughs) And I really, I really don't want to. I don't want to read these books either. Right. And it's, it will only increase the existing gap because it's not as if writers are equally represented in the field of publishing to begin with. Yeah. I'm glad you brought this up since I do feel that we're talking about all this, we need to draw a line between big traditional publishers and self-published authors. When it comes to self-publishing, the field is a bit different. It's somewhat easier to choose how we walk in that space differently. For big publishers who have the ability to throw millions behind a book, what we continue to see is that they choose to throw this kind of money behind books that are written by white authors instead of writers of color. Yeah, and so the lack of gatekeepers in the indie world really allows all kinds of authors to publish their stories. And with the greater diversity in authors, often comes a greater diversity in representations. True, traditional publishers are also increasingly aware of the need for more diverse stories, or at least they seem to be. But there are some caveats here. There is this author that I follow on Instagram. Okay. Uh, Her name is Claribel A. Ortega. She wrote Ghost Squad. Um, and a while ago, um, I'll I'll look it up and and see if I can find the link. She published this reel, um, of one of her TikToks on Instagram. And basically what she did was show what it's like being a black indigenous author of color, dealing with traditional publishing houses and the sudden interest by these publishing houses for their stories. Like what that's like. You told me about this one. I did because it was so on point and there's so many like she she mentions a bunch of issues and amongst issues she mentions in this very short reel was um you know that publishers for example they buy the same concepts from white authors which you know is where that whole own voices versus allied writers discussion comes in for me right they buy Mm -hmm. 
the same concept from white authors, right? So yeah. I get that you start saying, um, why are you writing that story? It's my story to, to, to write, right? Or it's my story to sell in this case then. Um, so another point she makes is that, and this is just, it's so, I'm, I'm cringing again. Like it's, it's, it's awful. Apparently, um, and like as a, like as a white writer, as a white author, I cannot imagine somebody asking me this, right? So um, apparently publishers ask Black, Indigenous, or authors of color to add more pain to their narratives because that will make their books sell better. Yeah, I've heard about this. I It's awful. Yeah, it just, it just makes me, yeah, it just makes me really angry <laughs> on a lot of levels. Um, so she continues by saying... Um, the publishers also just go like, oh, well, we already have one Latinx Black Indigenous book this season, so I'm sorry. Um, and there's always the fact that publishers pay Black Indigenous or authors of color less money. Um, but then, of course, you know, when these authors get upset about any of this, suddenly they're the problem. Yeah, we talked about this briefly during the first episode, that it, it's harder to publish traditionally when you don't belong to the majority of voices already out there because the advances are calculated based on what's already selling. We all know whose voices are overly <laughs> represented within the market. Um, mm. I don't know about you, but to me, this screams systemic discrimination. Like it's in the oh. system. Yeah, but that's exactly what it is. It's, system, it, it's a systemic discrimination, systemic inclusion, uh, exclusion, not inclusion, exclusion. Um, and obviously this needs to change so that more diverse voices will be included so that one day they are no longer considered minority voices at all. I mean, a girl can dream, right? <laughs> she has to, right? Um, but yes, it's true that these things are gradually, if slowly, shifting. And that if we wait long enough, representation, representation might actually be equal across the board one day but and this is where we land on their own voices versus writing people not like you debate why wait for this why put all of this labor on those diverse authors when we can actively contribute to creating a more diverse reading experience now why can we not both create space for diverse authors and their voices while we ourselves are working hard to turn this world into a better place i guess that's why we're doing this podcast exactly that is why we're doing this podcast. And, and can I just say, now we're talking about own voices, that this fear of misrepresenting, misrepresenting diverse characters is not only present among the more privileged communities. It isn't. And that brings us to the last fear that we wanted to discuss in this episode. What if I yeah. misrepresent my own community? Yeah. My husband wrote in his author note of his own book about the potential that some people might accuse him of whitewashing his black character. And my husband is a black man. Um, and even though he didn't whitewash his character, uh, due to a lack of visibility of different kinds of black people in the media, some people might think that um, mm -hmm. because there are aspects to this character that are much more like my husband feels for himself. Like, there are aspects of himself in this character and aspects of other people. And it's a, it's a black character, but he's very much not like portrayals that you see in a certain kind of media. Like he's not a gangster. He doesn't do hip hop. He's not a soldier. Um, so yeah. that was, that was the thing that he prepared himself for because he's experienced it in real life about himself that just black men like him don't show up in literature as much. It hasn't been on the big billboards of like, you know, I'm different. And I'm not gonna spoil the story and explain exactly how he's different because I would actually spoil the story and I promise not to do that. But go read it <laughs> if you're yeah. worried, like read the author note. Um, and then there was one more example that, that just hit me on the head. I actually shared it with my husband because we were talking about his book. There was an Iranian American on The Daily Show talking about potential backlash on him to doing a show on Iranian Americans because even though he is Iranian American, he can't write all Iranian American experiences. There are different mm -hmm. kinds of Iranian American communities, and then each yeah. Iranian American has their different experiences and their different perspectives. So he's like, I'm writing about the Iranian American community experience that I know 
And I yeah. fully expect people to disagree with it in my own community. Yeah. Well, this brings us back to what we've already established, right? There's diversity within diversity. Communities are made up of individuals. And like you just explained, like how, because uh, I remember actually watching The Daily Show, and so I have seen this. Um, that within a bigger community, there are smaller communities and those little smaller communities, they are made up of individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And while it might sound like a silly fear being afraid to misrepresent those with the same identity markers, there's a reason for it. Um, I believe we go into more detail on that one in episode five, or we will, when we discuss in depth how representation actually works. Yeah, I believe that's episode five, yeah. Yeah, trying to plan it here. Okay, so I'm not going to go into too much detail then. But when we're used to seeing a plethora of representation of a certain group, like white, middle class, straight, cis, hetero men, it becomes pretty impossible to fold all members of that group together. Hmm. When we read novels about white, straight, cis, het men, we are much less inclined to think that these novels represent all white, straight, cis, het men in the world. And that's because we know tons of stories about white, straight, cis, has men, and they're all different kinds of stories, different kinds of people. Yeah, we do, because their voices and stories are literally everywhere. Yes. So you can read about, you can read about an ex-murderer and not go, oh, all white, straight, cis, hetero men are ex-murderers? Oh, I didn't know that, because there are so many stories out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But when someone writes a character who doesn't have that kind of presence, like their appearance or their minority status doesn't have that kind of presence, we're much more inclined to see that character as representative of the entire community they belong to. Yes. And this is why even if you as a minority writer are representing what's generally considered your own community, the stakes are still higher. Because representations are lacking, so more people will see your representation as speaking to and for a larger audience. Even if that's not what you're trying to do at all. Which is probably why your husband included that in the author note. It was, because it, it, to me it sounds like a disclaimer saying, I'm not speaking for you all. I'm not sure he even wrote it as a disclaimer, more as stating a fact, because that's very much how he is. He's like, take it or leave it. <laughs> Well, that's good um but yeah but the thing is of course like even if you're not trying to represent your larger community and i don't i, th I think most writers don't um but even if that's not your intention that doesn't really matter to the reader uh because the reader doesn't care what your intentions are the reader is just reading your book um and they do with that book what they want to do you know they do with that story what they want to do so if you're disenfranchised and surrounded by too many negative stereotypical representations, each new representation that's added to that pile counts. So if this, if this is just another representation that doesn't make you feel seen, um, it makes sense that, you know, as a reader, you don't really appreciate what this community member is doing. But, you know, of course, this is neither the author's fault nor is it the fault of the reader. I mean, the author has every right to tell their story the way they see it. And the reader has every right to want to be represented properly. Yeah. This is making me think of the book Angela's Ashes, but I won't get into it at the moment. So yeah, I agree. Okay. I actually, it's, that's another one I haven't read. Um, so I would say that what's the blame here I'm really curious about that book now because I, I know I know the story a little bit, but I haven't actually read the book. Neither have I seen the film. So trying to stay, <laughs> trying to stay on topic, I would say the the what is to blame here, right? Um, like looking at your husband's case, it isn't that there aren't enough representations. Um, or the problem is. I I'm, I'm just, I'm stuck in the book now. I'm stuck in the book that I haven't read now. I'm like, what do I'm I so sorry. Do you want story? me to explain briefly? Yes, just do it. Because now I'm like, I, I kind of know the story, but I haven't read it. So now okay. I'm like, okay. Just so I'm, I'm Irish on my father's side. Very Irish. And Angela's Ashes is a book about Irish immigrants in the US. And it's extremely sad. Like I read 40 or 50 pages of it. 
I couldn't finish the book. My, my father couldn't finish the book. My grandmother read it and like cried through it and talked about how amazing it was. And like, it represented like the Irish community struggles and everything, but there is a horrific amount of abuse and trauma and pain that really did happen to my community. I wouldn't want to hand this book to people outside of my Irish community, immigrant family community and say, Hey, this represents us because we sound like basket cases that suffer a lot. And I know there's some happy endings. I'm not sure so much because people never talk about that to me, at least the people in my family who read it. But on the other hand, you have like Irish Catholic people like JFK who became president. So that balance it out. Like you can talk mm-hmm. about the horrible, you know, history that Irish immigrants do have. And then you have really successful families in the US. So it balances it out. But I wouldn't like, I, I can't own that book and say, yeah, that. I can say, yeah, some of that's in my family history. Absolutely. And if I don't know you really well, I'm not going to tell you about it. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you. <laughs> so Thank you sorry. for clarifying that. My curiosity is now satisfied. Okay. So but what I was going to say, because we were talking about the fact that, um, you know, every author has the right to tell their story and every reader has the right to want to be represented properly. Um, or in your case, want to be represented not as basket cases um but i would say that what's actually to blame here is that there aren't enough representations especially when we talk about um the book that your husband wrote there aren't enough representations of black men representations show them in all the diversity that's what's to blame because if there were if there were enough representations of black men your husband wouldn't need wouldn't need um to write down in his author know that he might be called out for whitewashing anything. Yeah, it would because people would know. Yeah, because people would know he isn't whitewashing anything because there are black men like that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so where are we? Because we kind of got on a tangent. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, we do that. Um, well, at the beginning, because I just mentioned again, like like I was just thinking at the beginning, you said like being called out is, you know, not a fear. It's not a fear we included. Um, because for me, it's, I would say that being called out is the feared consequence of all those other things we fear. The reason that we fear them is because we're afraid that somebody is going to say, this writer did this, this writer said that. And especially this day and age, like things like that can go viral really quickly. Get dragged all over the social media. <laughs> yeah, it's like you have trolls, you have everything. Um, no wonder so many authors go, no, thank you. That's enough. I'm not going to get involved. Yes, this is the thing, right? Like, um, wouldn't you like, wouldn't you be like, let's stay in our comfort zones? I mean, I'm not good at staying in my comfort zone, but that's only because there's some place I want to go and it's usually beyond my comfort zone. <laughs> like doing this podcast. Exactly. Yes. So, so uh, yes, but okay. So this is us, they are, this is us. <laughs> and this is like doing the podcast is really beyond our comfort zone as well. Um, so but just, we're going to be know, all cheerful about it and keep doing it anyway. Yes, because this is like, <laughs> yeah this is like I'm very much like even if you fear it that shouldn't keep you from trying that's 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 me it's like you know feel the fear and do it anyway um yeah my dad yeah, would say if you're of... scared of it go do it yes and I, I'm very much like I used to have in my in my old uh in my old office I had you know wanted more than you're afraid of it like on the wall Mm. right and I think the same goes um for for this for um for writing diverse characters I think there is much more at stake in not trying at all than there is in trying right because if you try you have a shot at doing right by whomever you're representing and I don't think it's too hard to do it right to do right by anyone if you're doing it in an informed sensitive and sensible manner right Yes. Do you think people will get sick and tired of us saying that over and over? I mean, I think at this point we've said it to each other so much getting ready to do this. So yeah, I, I, it bears repeating. It does bear repeating. Like die trying, which is like my thing, right? 
Um, it, it's better to die trying. The same goes for representing their first characters. But because of this, because of this fear, specifically because of, the, of this fear of being called out, um, we came up with what we call the calm the fuck down checklist, didn't we? Yes, I'm going to blame you for that title. <laughs> I don't know why, but there's no controlling whether or not uh, we'll be called out for something, no matter how hard we work at getting it right. So we wanted to offer something that will help you, the writers listening to this podcast, with the one thing you can control, which is how you respond to being called out. Yes, because this is the thing, right? You cannot control, like when you write a book, you cannot control its perception. No. But yeah, you can control how you respond to how people perceive it. Yes. Uh, and how they receive it. So as per usual, we'll add a link to this particular checklist um, and for which Bethany, apparently Bethany blames me for the title. I did come up with the title. That's very true. Um, Calm the fuck down. We're putting a link in the in the show notes um, and you can also find it on our blog at representation matters.art that's art so basically if someone calls you out because you've been writing go read this checklist first and do it take a deep breath do that checklist first before you type anything back or scream at anybody or melt just just go look at this checklist first take a deep breath no it's not you're not the first one it's happened to and if it happened online especially you don't have to respond right away you can walk away yeah because so, first do- yeah first you have to calm the fuck down yes that's always and, a good way to start <laughs> yes and our checklist is gonna help you with that yes so do let us know if you find it useful yes please do because this is the fun part before it's time to check for commas and iron out passive voice fiction writers need to know that their story is strong are your beta readers not finishing Do they have multiple conflicting complaints? When you ask them questions about your story, do they give lukewarm responses? If yes, you may need to refine your story structure. In editing your novel structure, tips, tricks, and checklists to get you from start to finish, Bethany walks you through the process of assessing your novel, from characters to pacing with lots of compassion and a generous dash of humor. In easy to follow directions and using adaptable strategies, this handbook shows you how to check your story for plot holes, settle timeline confusion, snap character arcs into place, and more. Find it on Amazon, Kobo, or Barnes & Noble, or follow the link in the show notes to get yourself a copy now. Thank you for listening. Music for this show was written and produced by Eric Mills. If you want to join the conversation, fill out our write and read a questionnaires. Both can be found in the show notes and on our website, representationmatters.art. That's dot A-R-T. If you want to be the first to hear when a new episode comes out, sign up to our newsletter. And if you found this helpful, please rate and review on your favorite podcast app to help other writers find us too.